Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charlie Nicklin. I'm the Chief Exec of I Agree, and I'd like to thank you all for joining our August presentation today. I'd like to welcome I Agree member and incorporated engineer Will Chua, who is going to talk to us today about anaerobic digestion plants and feedstocks. Will graduated from Harper Adams in 2004, and he spent around 15 years in the tractor and machinery industry, predominantly with John Deere, but also in tractor dealerships. Will entered the world of AD plants in 2015 with AWS Power, and just un and then just under five years, he set up his own consultancy business in 2019, specialising in the subject of today's lecture. So just before Will starts, as normal, you're all currently muted. If you'd like to ask questions, then please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen, and then we'll at the end of the presentation, we'll unmute people so they can ask in person. Over to you, Will. Thank you. Okay, hopefully you can all see my screen. That's, um, so uh, welcome uh, and thanks to the I agree for asking me here this afternoon to do a lunch, lunchtime lecture. So uh, the title of my presentation is Anaerobic Digestion, a Volatile Business. And some of you might have recognized that from the, uh, the Reekin presentation I did, which is slightly different from what I told Sarah, but I thought it was very apt at the moment uh, for what we're going to discuss. So. Uh, I was going to just give myself a brief introduction, but thank you, Charlie, for doing that. So, yeah, I am William Tewer, um, and I have a business, WST Rural, uh, and I also have another business with a business partner, which is Will and Al's Natural Plant Food Company. Um, so a little bit about what I do first before we move into the subject of anaerobic digestion. So WST Rural is predominantly a consultancy business aimed towards uh, AD and on-farm AD energy advisory. Uh, within that, I advise, I have a handful, uh, a dozen or so clients, which I advise on a regular basis. Uh, so I do management consultancy. Uh, I also do some apps uh, for business. So I've got several businesses using uh, an app product, which I designed. Um, and also I do a, a bit on feedstock management, farming type things in the dairy industry. And then aside from that, I have a company with a business partner called Alice DeWannock, who's an, uh, an entrepreneur from Carlisle, who has an AD plant in the farm and some other businesses. And we have Will and Al's Natural Plant Food Company. And that was really a tail off from AD, uh, where we make products from the byproduct of anaerobic digestion. And then uh, I have a, a family farm with my parents uh, in the uplands of Cumbria. Uh, we were a mixed upland farm and we have a large or a medium sized uh, tourism uh, business on that farm uh, where we cover in holly cottages, campsites, camping pods, et cetera, et cetera. So anaerobic digestion, and I, I've chosen a picture which is probably quite close to me, uh, has been one of my favorite types of AD plants and I'll come on to that. So th this just for information is a 124 kilowatt AD plant located on a dairy farm just north of Carlisle. And that farm run, that AD plant runs predominantly on uh, slurry and a mixture of waste silages. So the, the sides, the tops of silage pits, the sweepings up of the, the alleyways and the sweeping out uh, that come from the farming business. And I thought it's quite a, a neat uh, sort of starter to the presentation. There's one of my favorite AD plants. And when I was working for W, uh, sorry, for AWS Power Limited, I, uh, I would sell several of these uh, across the UK to dairy farmers. And that was under what at the time was the feeding tariff um, through Ofgem. And they are quite a useful sized AD plant. They produce sufficient energy generally for a, a medium to large sized dairy farm, plus giving some export and plus giving some heat use. So that AD plant is producing biogas, which is then burned in, a, in an engine, uh, which then creates electricity for a generator and exports to the grid. So I'm going to move through lots of things here. So there's quite a lot to take on board. So I'm trying to just sort of summarize the aspects of AD and then we can go into the questions at the end. So apologies if I don't go into full detail because some of these sections, you could probably do a presentation in itself on them. So anaerobic digestion is really just a four stage process where organic material is broken down by bacteria and organisms in the absence of air. So you put it in a sealed environment and uh, bacteria reacts and it does it generally in four processes and we can see that have been hydrolysis, acidogenous, acidogenic, and then finally methogenic, 
which is really the ending point at where we, we take them previous processes and we, we end up with methane, uh, carbon dioxide, water, and some other impurities in which we would understand as biogas. And I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit further on in the presentation on that. From an AD plant perspective, so when we look at the, the UK AD sector, there is round about 500, just over 500 active or semi-active AD plants in the UK, which are feeding a mixture of wastes and energy crops. And then on top of that, there is around about 170 uh, sewage based AD plants. Um, so it gives, so in, in essence, it's, it's a relatively small sector if you were to compare it against um, other aspects of industry, but, but an important sector in the way that it's managing waste products and also generating energy. And what we will see from AD plants is there is generally no set design and a lot of plants vary really based on the feedstock they're going to use or the biological principle of the supplying company or manufacturer. What similarities there would be, though, is they're generally a liquid based plant. So unlike composting, which is a, a dry process, uh, AD is generally a wet process where we are taking material and liquid uh, and essentially almost fermenting it. And within that, we generally have two operational ranges. First being mesophilic at around about 25 to 42 degrees centigrade. Now, scientifically, people would debate the temperature ranges because bacteria strains work across different ranges. But generally, as an industry, we would see the two main temperature ranges that AD plants operate being is mesophilic and then thermophilic at 42 to 60 degrees. Uh, Celsius. They have their advantages and their disadvantages. And to summarize that, mesophilic is generally seen in the industry as being slightly easier to operate. Uh, the management of your acids is slightly easier in the process, where thermophilic can be a little bit more challenging to operate, but you will receive you will get better results of, I would say, slightly higher energy release from the feedstock that, that you're using. And when we look at an AD plant and how it's fed. Um, we could refer to it as a, as a ruminant animal almost. So we, we feed it a mixture of dry liquids or a combination together. Uh, and I've chosen some pictures just highlighting the different designs of AD plants that are operational around the UK. And I think to a degree, the AD industry has been challenged on uh, its its function and its reliability because of the vast differences in design and design principles. And that's something as when I entered the industry, I was really surprised that is, is the different principles that people applied to do the same process, which is anaerobic digestion. So how does anaerobic digestion work? And I've tried to put it down to a real simplistic form here. So we take liquid feeds, solid feeds, and that could be a, a feed of any sort of waste and energy crop, a sewage. And we imply it into a, into a sealed environment. That could be the, the AD plant, which could be a tank or tanks. Uh, and we influence it to three main factors in a controlled environment. And that would be temperature, moisture, and time. And the result from that, we hope, is we get biogas, which then in turn can be turned into electricity into a biomethane product. And then from that, we also get additional products such as carbon dioxide or digestate as a, as a byproduct, which it could be seen as a, a natural fertilizer. So what is biogas? And, and biogas in its raw form is a relatively dirty product. It doesn't necessarily have a particularly high calorific value compared against other products. And you'll see that in the bottom right hand side of my screen, where I've taken an extract which shows you comparisons between different types of anaerobic digesters, giving you different outputs of biogas. And then the far right, you will see that comparison with natural gas. So actually, AD in itself is a relatively dirt, dirty product. It produces a dirty gas. And we can see that. I've taken what I've seen as a, uh, where I've got a scale of biogas, that's taken from on-farm AD, where there's a mixture of energy crops and farm waste, so there's manures and slurries, where we'll see between a 52 to 
methane, if we took a, a cubic meter of biogas, uh, we then have got carbon dioxide, we've got some oxygen, we've got nitrogen, ammonium, hydrogens, and then we also have very small levels of other contaminants, and also quite a lot in raw biogas of water vapor, or what we know as condensate. If we then want to take that and create what would be referred to as biomethane, which we hear a lot more about in the press, or just pure methane, we have to strip out them extras. And biomethane in itself isn't actually a pure product. It can be a mixture of certain products because when we clean biogas through either scrubbing, um, pasteurization or other processes, we end up with, a, with a, a product which maybe needs tweaking to, to the end user. And the end user could be the gas grid, so where it goes to consumers in the house, or it could be into commercial environment. And some of the interesting things they may do to that is, for example, add very small amounts of propane to increase its calorific value or its wooble, um, and also an odorant, because in itself, it's very difficult to detect methane, which is why it is intrinsically quite dangerous, a very dangerous product. Uh, so we'll put an odorant into it prior to a secondary use so that actually you can physically smell that product. I've slightly moved on the, um, from it to, to actually understand what is operational and benchmarking of AD. And when I'm considering AD, which is part of my job role, is I generally look at it, and also this is an industry, look at it across three different sectors. So when you're operating an AD plant, and these are all important, they all link into feedstock and the output. And the first, we have biological aspects, then we have feeding aspects, and then we have mechanical aspects. And even though AD is a very simplistic in its raw form, an AD plant is, is actually a very complex um, animal. It has lots of things going on biologically, which require lots of observation, testing and analysis. And, and I'll go back to our original side saying, well, there isn't really one leading design principle in AD plant design, which means that actually a lot of different scientific analysis is applied to different plants. So I have had to pick what I think is really sort of the basic principles of what you look for when you're operating an AD plant. And when we look at biological, we consider the basics, which would be temperature, as I referred to back. You know, we have temperature ranges where bacteria work. Outside of them temperature ranges, we get different bacteria, which can be negative to the process. So very important to measure temperature, which in the line, we have pH. We then have something called FOSTAC, which is a scientific calculation to understand the activity and the, the energy inside digestate, which is, in, which is in your AD plant. And if you're taking that analysis on a regular basis, you can build a picture on the health of your AD plant. And then to the more obvious things of biogas. So what is your biogas made up of? From experience, you can see in AD plants as biogas, changes for example the methane maybe drops that could be a result in changing a feedstock but it all can be a result of a changing biological health of the plant which leads us on to for example vfa so volatile fatty acids so profiling the acids inside that ad plant is is very important to understand the stability in the action and if i go then back to sort of three principles of ad you've got temperature moisture and time Another one is, is feeding. AD works consistently if it's fed consistently. And if we bring it back to farming aspects, which we relate to, when we feed animals, consistency of feed, consistency of climate temperature management is critical to the health and, and the performance of an animal. And it is very, very similar in AD. If we feed it the similar crop in a similar condition, in a similar environment, we will see, we will see positive results from that and your performance can be measured as you tweak them aspects. As you can see on the screen, uh, I've taken some snapshots of some of the things I do, which leads us to feeding aspects of whether that's a waste product. Um, we, will, we can look at it from an organic loading rate. So physically, how much organic material are we putting in? So we're using reference of kilograms of organic material per meter cubed of operational space inside your AD plant. So if you imagine you've got a, a tank, it's got a certain amount of capacity 
of digest it inside that and you put a new feed in it. You want to understand how much feed you're putting in and you can then generate a ratio and you can benchmark that against good biological health against the ratio of feeding. And that develops a picture over time. And that is, I, I always feel it's quite relevant in energy crop plants because as, as the energy crop profile changing, for example, as crop, uh, for example, silages may change. We've had a very challenging year in the UK in growing crops, so we'll have different energy profiles. It's really important to understand that. And if we break that down into dry matters, we then want to look beyond dry matter and understand organic dry matter. So what is actual volatile solid? And if I refer back to my uh, opening title, volatile solids are essentially what is consumable, and that's really important. And another factor which I think I didn't appreciate until I've been in the business is retention time. So if you imagine a, a ruminant, which is a cow, they consume product, they've got several stomachs, they pass that product around when they're cutting it, uh, and they spend time digesting that product. Some products will be digested quicker than others. And the same applies in AD. If your AD plant is technically too small, you will never get the, re the, the re performance from that feedstock you feed it. If it's too large, you maybe can't feed it enough, quick enough, to, to keep the product cycle working, so the bi biology active. So retention time is a really important uh, number in AD operation. So how long that product stays in that plant and how the gases releases from it. And then sort of a third point when it comes to, to operation analysis, benchmarking, and just general basic operation is understanding really simple things such as mixer loads if you're agitating your AD plant, pump loads if you are pumping material around it or pumping material into it, biogas flows and power consumption. And you'll see a picture on the screen here. Um, the plants that I oversee and assist with, a lot of them man uh, monitor that now, which gives us great insight. And actually the mechanical monitoring of a plant can give us indications of a plant health before biological aspects. Uh, and I'm finding if, if you send out uh, something to a laboratory that maybe takes 10 days to process before you get the results back. So actually mechanical monitoring and, and, and actually looking at your plant and installing software or hardware to allow you to, to mechanically monitor the plant can be as effective to a degree as, as laboratory sampling. The two work absolutely perfect in tandem but when I look at the industry, I feel it, you know, it is paramount that we, we monitor uh, a plant from a mechanical aspect. And I guess that comes back to my agricultural days. When we look at machinery, one of the basic things we do is we do mechanical checks. We look at fuel consumption, we look at engine RPM, we look at temperatures. The same applies in AD. You very quickly can understand if there is a problem or there is a developing problem by monitoring mechanical aspects of an AD plant. And actually in the industry, sometimes until recently, I felt that's probably one of the last things people did was monitor the mechanical aspects, the, the, the electricity loading on pumps and things like that. And the operators who now do it, my plant owners, they get great insight into that. And then I've also included a picture of a laboratory analysis, which again is really important. Regular laboratory analysis gives you an overview of bacteria activity. Uh, it gives you an, a, an acid activity and you can develop a trend. And if you set a benchmark with your plant is healthy, you start to analyze that, you build that picture up over several months. You then, as things change, for example, feedstocks change or temperatures change, as things change, you can recognize that because you've actually benchmarked your AD plant. Slightly moving to a completely different subject, but I think it's important um, to understand and that is what are the main financial drivers of the AD sector in the UK and there is quite a few things there and I've summarized what I think are the main aspects and I've broken them down into two main sections firstly off gem which is fundamentally where we look at tariff or grant positioning on plants and then open market so off gem are the regulatory body of energy um, production in the UK and there's been various tariffs and the most popular one which we would know of is, is feeding tariff. And that's where a majority of AD plants in the UK were built under that funding scheme, which runs for 20 years. 
the first scheme which was active was I think it was around it was 2002 which was renewable obligations where we start to see the first movements from government legislation into renewable generation and then that's moved forward where we had the feed-in tariff which came in in 2010 up till 2020 1920 then we have the RHI so the renewable heat incentive and then very recently, so the start of well, the mid last year is the green gas incentive, which is if we refer back to biomethane, which is the creation of green gas from waste. So to a degree, you can use some energy crop in that uh, and you will receive then a tariff off the back of that generation. If we then look at the other market forces, which I would describe as open market forces, we've got several things which can come in and there will be others there. Um, first and foremost, if you were generating electricity from AD, the likelihood is you were exporting that into the national grid. So first and foremost, you will receive a subsidy for that generation. Then the actual electricity that you put into the national grid, you will have some form of PPA, which is a power purchase agreement. So you will sell that to a wholesaler or a, uh, for example, uh, maybe somebody like Good Energy, uh, and they will pay based on a contract, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, for that electricity you produce and put into the, into the national grid. Then we have the term gate fee. So, for example, if you were a waste AD plant, uh, you may be receiving waste from, for example, a, uh, a distillery. Uh, it could be a dairy processing. And certain products, uh, or I would say products that are waste, would have a fee for you to take that. So you could charge say eight pound a cube just very theoretical that for each cube of product you take in then process through ad uh, so that is a, a, a i would call it a generator income then we have heat usage so as i mentioned the rhi so renewable heat incentive again that's paid on units of heat you generate and you use you can sell that heat and there are varying uh, many many different things out there for selling heat. Now we see them de developing district heating, which actually is something which has been relatively slow in the UK, um, or probably one of the slowest aspects when you look at the AD market across the world and elsewhere, district heating is normally a primary heat use source or heat usage of that heat use. Um, where in the UK, we've been very slow actually to, to take up on that and is that incentive or is that cost of, of installing that so when you take the heat from that ad plant and push it out to homes or businesses then we have contract drying uh, which has been more popular because it's probably the easiest thing to implement on a on a site it could be the drying of wood chip it could be drying of other products of grain of distillery products um, etc then we have electricity usage and that could i'll put that as a separate from the ppa because uh, there is several sites out there where they actually sell their power um, to uh, another private company. Or a, so, if you're located, to, for example, next to a um, industrial estate, you maybe have a line, a physical wire going from your generator transformer to that business, and you measure how much electricity they are taking, and you have a, a inter-company agreement with them, and you basically have a private sale agreement or private wire supply, as it's referred to. And then latterly, which has been one of the later developments, is, is physical gas sales, and that could be of methane, absolute pure methane. It could be biomethane, carbon dioxide, and we're starting to see other things come from what is removed from biogas in itself. So. Uh, that's a relatively new uh, part of the industry, and that's probably something with the green gas incentive, we're going to see that grow more rapidly, uh, opposed to the other ones which have been in place for several years. I've just sort of focused on electricity sales, because I think when we look at the press today, we look at physical electricity pricing. It's interesting to understand a little bit. This is probably a presentation in itself. The electricity market is or well, the energy market in itself is a, a very, very complex um, business. You know, there's many mechanisms in there which dictate or try to manage price. And uh, until very recently, it would have been quite easy to explain uh, to a degree level of, of energy pricing. But as, as we know, we have had some very 
unknown external forces come in and alter the price. But aside from that, there is lots of things which dictate energy pricing. And then this is a snapshot of wholesale energy pricing. So this isn't consumer pricing, this is wholesale energy pricing. And as you can see on the screen, so this is a snapshot from a trading platform called Line Jump. They trade a lot of electricity. I've deal, I deal with them uh, in my consultancy business. As you can see, electricity pricing, as we know, has gone up massively. Um, but just on a, a half hourly basis, electricity pricing is hugely variable inside of them huge price rises. And you can see that at the bottom of the screen in the, in the graph, which shows us day ahead pricing. So we can see as we go through the day, how that pricing alters. And one of the major factors, which I put in the right hand side of the screen is price factory. So if you were operating an AD plant, which is producing electricity and you're going to sell your electricity, there is also, aside from market forces, there is other things which affect that. First and foremost, are you described as a base load generator? An AD is generally seen as a base load generator. So it generates electricity within reason, 24 seven, 365 days a year, almost irrelevant of what would be seen as climatic changes, which is relevant to solar uh, and, to, and to other wind, for example. Um, so generally, AD follows what would be called a base load pricing matrix. And within that, we then have the obvious contract type and length. So how long do you as an AD company fix that price for? You could sell you all your electricity next day, which can be very rewarding, but also it can be very challenging because not only can the price be positive, it could be negative. So if we have a very, very windy day, it's very sunny, there is little load on the grid, which happened during COVID, the price actually goes negative. We then have half hourly performance. So majority of all electricity generation and consumption in the UK is measured in half hourly increments. And that's generally how your meter works in your house. And that's mainly the protocol of what smart metering works off is half hour consumption figures. So that, that's a factor and what your performance is. And these are related. So the, what you see in my screen there, so half hourly performance, grid reliability, internal parasitic consumption, site location, GIDOS and triads are all related in some way. And then if I take a typical example of GIDOS, which is generated distribution use of the system, that is a, is a premium or a cost applied to the price of electricity at purchase, depending on the location of that AD plant and depending on factors around that generator. So it could be the performance of the local grid. Can that power be transmitted cost effectively to consumers? Is the grid capable of transmitting that power without a lot of factors influencing it? And the, that can have a can have a quite a, a reasonable bearing on the price of power you sell, depending on where you are located in in the UK. And one of the other main factors, which has been a, a particularly good, I wouldn't say cash cow, but a, an incentive in energy ge generation, is triads, and we sometimes see triads in the press. And that is, at certain times of the year. Main, well, absolutely in winter, at certain time periods during the day, the national grid comes under, at certain areas, comes under what you describe as stress. So it is very close to its maximum capacity. That generally occurs on cold, damp, low wind days in end of November, December, January, when there's probably very little solar. We have a high pressure maybe builds over the UK, Scottish wind, off sea wind drops back because we don't have the wind load in there to generate the electricity. Then everybody comes home from work between half past four or five o'clock, they put the kettles on, they put the washers on, they put the tumble dryers on, industry's still working. Um, the grid comes under, the under its maximum strain. And if you are exporting electricity during them time periods, and as a, as a generator, you don't know when that's going to occur, you can only assume, you can be rewarded quite handsomely for generating electricity during them time periods. And that generally happens three times a year. And that's chosen 
by energy regulator when that occurs. We, as energy generators, we don't know. We can predict that. And as an energy generator in a triad area, because not all parts of the UK come under triads, it's just generally areas of high population or high grid stress come under triad. If you're operating during them periods, that can be very financially rewarding to you as a business. Okay, again, moving on to something slightly different, but again, it linking in is potential feedstocks for AD. And I've broken that down into three areas. So first of all, we have waste products, then byproducts, and then energy crops. And AD has generally in the UK been a mix of all of these. First and foremost, sewerage, the most, where majority of early AD plant development went, sewage works. Um, that's always been used as a process to, to help um, clean out, clean sewage essentially created part of the process. And as I said, there's around about 170 uh, sewage based, purely sewage based AD plants in the UK at um, water utility sites. We then have food wastes, and I would describe them as non primary food wastes because generally primary food waste can fall into byproducts. We then have animal byproducts, AVP products, and then at manures and slurries. The byproduct is a is a is a certainly a debatable area in the in the industry, but also in I would say in the farming sector as well, because some of that product has come from a waste. Um, so we've got animal feed manufacturing wastes, we've got spent grains and kernels, whey permeates, which comes out of the dairy industry, distillery products, so two or three, for example, draft uh, is, a, is a product which comes out of distillery, then distillery washings, uh, and then fats and proteins from secondary food production. And then finally, we've got energy crop, and I think everyone would recognise maize, May silage, probably predominant in the AD industry, uh, and then to a degree some of the grain. We then have whole crops, cereals, uh, and grain cereals. We have hybrid rye, which is, I would say, a relatively newbie into the AD industry, came over from the continent where it was used heavily in pig industry and is starting to be used in the cattle and pig sector over here, but is an interesting crop because maturity generally occurs before uh, whole crop cereals so allows secondary cropping to follow on behind that whether that's two or three grass crops and then we have grass silage energy beets and lucerne there's probably lots of other products i could add to them list but i've picked what i see as the sort of the main uh, ones and from an energy perspective grass silage uh, is a fantastic product but it's actually probably one of the most challenging products to operate an ad plant on and, you know, I, I have a lot to do with AD plants, which are using grass silage uh, as, a, as a feedstock. And when it comes to operation any day, maize is much simpler. Uh, grass silage is naturally hydrophobic, so it wants to deflect um, water to, to a degree. And even after it's been ensiled, that still occurs. So imagine that reflection still takes place to a degree in the AD plant until it's been subject to heat or mechanical um, processing to allow that bacteria to get under the surface. So a, a ruminant or, or any animal will, well, not any animals because they don't eat grass, but a ruminant will take grass and it will, will cut it. So it will, it will mush it up into a fine form. And that's probably something we've not been very good at in the AD industry. And I've yet to really find a technology which can do that at a low energy cost. And cows are very good at doing that. They're designed to do it. Where AD plants, you know, mainly come from a German background, that technology then fetched over into UK. We're really focused on the mazes and the grain type products with, with energy beets and not really built to handle grass silage. And that for one of the biggest issues in in the UK sector from an energy, um, energy crop point of view is actually AD plants been able to use grass silage. It, it is a really, really challenging crop. Um, which then leads us on to a, a couple of other things and I'll, I'll talk about these more on another slide. But first of all is pasteurization pass 110, which is a protocol. If you were using any waste, depending on the hazard around that waste, you then have to put that waste through a process to ensure that it's safe. Either that's before AD or after AD. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. 
and then the cost and usable energy of any of these feedstocks, which again, I'm gonna to talk to in more detail. So then two points, pasteurization, cost and usable energy. If I take my three points, I've got three points on feedstock. Whether that feedstock is a waste product, a byproduct, or an energy crop, generally we will look at three points on it. Firstly, its biological aspects, then its performance, and then its financial performance aspects. They all interlink, but I've tried to break them down in what we would look at. So biological aspects, we would look at energy density of that product. It's, for example, its metabolic energy, its sugars, its proteins, its dry matter, but very importantly, it's organic dry matter or volatile solids. So out of that 30% dry matter, how much of that 30% is actually consumable energy if you took away all the ash? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Then we move into performance. So we've got the energy density, but what is that physical gas yield? How long does it take that gas yield to be released? How digestible is that product to release that gas yield? And very importantly, how sustainable a supply? And if you think back to earlier in my presentation, AD is all about, or successful AD is all about consistency. So consistency of your feedstock supply is equally as important as your consistency of operating an AD plant. If your feedstock is consistent in its makeup, its energy profiling, it will help that plant deliver correctly. And we, whether we measure that in tons or we measure it in cubes or we measure it in scientific analysis. And the other interesting point is that laboratory analysis can deliver very different results from what you actually see in an AD plant. Because all AD plants are slightly different, they do deliver slightly different results from the same crop. So you may get a crop or a waste tested in a laboratory. It then goes to three different AD plants of different type manufacturer they will all see slightly different yields. So this does present an industry challenge that certain feedstocks, whether it be waste or energy, work differently in different plants. And that leads us into the financial aspects. So again, is it a waste product? Can you charge a gate fee for it? Or do you physically buy it? Is it a byproduct? Importantly, does Ofgem, if you were a feed-in tariff or an RHI or a green gas incentive scheme, or even renewable energy, renewable obligations, does your plant, can it actually accept that product in? Have you done the carbon calculation to understand that that's acceptable to off-gem? But also, does it require additional processing? So energy crop, the additional processing is getting it from the field to the clamp. What is that cost? Is it, if it's a waste, is it then taking that waste and making it into a usable form? If we imagine it comes in in a lumpy mass, you might need to turn that into a smoothie or a slushy. So you then can inject it into your plant. And if we talk about how that then affects, I've, I've taken two extracts of two different energy crops. So the, the top one is where you see method. That is a laboratory uh, analysis of a, I think that was a whole crop um, grain. I'm trying to think, uh, I think, yeah, it was wheat. That was wheat and it. We've got a moisture of 59.9. So we've, we've actually got a dry matter of uh, just shy over 40 uh, with an ash content of 1.4%, which gives us, based on uh, a laboratory analysis, of 215 cubic meters of biogas per ton of fresh matter. So that's a total fresh matter, not a dry matter. And if we compare it with the, the sample below, which actually that was, I, I think, was a late, very late grass crop. And interestingly, it pulled out a few anomalies, which suggest to me that was a late silage crop, which was probably old grass because we have quite a high ash content. So we either picked up a lot of contamination in that harvesting process or a lot of that grass had died off, new grass had formed, but you're still left with the sort of the stem cell um, carbon aspect of that crop. And that's only delivering us a gas yield of 90 cubes per fresh tonne of dry matter. So like anything in life, what you put in, you will get out. So if you put in a high energy feedstock, as long as your AD plant works and is functionally healthy, you will get a higher yield from that. And that is one of the challenges with AD is, is even just in this slide, we, we have huge variations. So we have grass silage, we have, we have maize silage. 
they all have different energy yields and you basically like it, for example, a dairy farm or a beef unit, you will build a diet. You need a diet uh, to, to be able to feed that plant consistently. Uh, and as you can see, there is quite huge variations when we actually drill down uh, and measure cropping. And it, it is very simple. When, we, when you look at a silage pit, you can look at a silage pit and you go, oh, that looks a fantastic crop. It's been really well ensiled. Uh, you know, we've gone through all the good practices and processes, but simply if it doesn't have sufficient sugars in it or proteins, then it's not going to deliver. Uh, and, and then many times I get faced with, well, actually, it looks fine. It smells fantastic. Yes, that is a good indicator that the initial basic quality of that feedstock is there. But does it tell us actually what the embedded energy is? Not necessarily, no. So for a lot of plants I deal with, I do actively encourage regular analysis of their cropping. But like anything, laboratory analysis doesn't exactly match what goes on in the can go on in an AD plant, but over time and over seasons, you can build a picture to understand. Hence why it's really important to try and mix, for example, if you're a silage based plant, grass silage based plant, you can mix your third and your first cuts together, ideally to give a balance of energy release. Energy cropping, I'm not necessarily, got, I'm just gonna go over this because again, this could be a presentation in itself, but it comes back to some of the things I've previously talked about. When it comes to energy crops, and I, and I do a lot of work in this field, um, it's amazing actually what gets missed off. And the, the, the industry is a lot better than it was when I was joined in 2015. Uh, you know, the technology, but also the, the insight. The, I, I, I actually felt the dairy industry was considerably ahead of AD when it came to cropping cropping mindset uh, and understanding the cropping cycle, especially in grass allergies and maize. And working with the farms I work with, two things are really important. If it's not measurable, it's not accountable. And being able, using the technology which is available today is a real eye opener for AD operators, uh, crop producers to, to, to understand, especially generally grass cropping has never been a particularly measured science we we would often look at growth rates but what actually was produced on a field was has never necessarily been been looked at in detail and something I, you know i saw learned to john dean worked with was really that technology becoming available has really been an eye opener for 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 crop producers and getting that full cycle of measuring your crop understanding yields understand your soil and understanding your diet. If you're working with an AD plant as a supplier or you're an AD plant who's taking energy crop, it's important to, to work with the farm, to have, a, to have a, a menu, so understand what your cropping plan is for 23 and 24, so that you've got even cycles of crop coming into the plant, which allows the operator or the, or the, the biologist to, to create a diet which is consistent. And I often find that that was not considered in many plants at the beginning, and it's taken time to develop and simply moving from one crop to another very quickly, you say in, in, a, in maybe a week, can upset the biology. So having cropping plan like you would on a, on, a, on a dairy farm or a beef fattening unit or even an arable farm, that cropping aspect is, is really, really good practice. And I picked some pictures because in the top right hand side, that is a undersown maize crop. It's in Dumfrieshire. And, and what the client there is doing is, is trying to get a secondary crop off that, but not necessarily for cropping for the AD. That is for their livestock. So as you can see, just there is very briefly in the picture, there is some sheep on there. So that AD operator is looking to graze sheep on that, which gives winter cover it also actually, there's, a, there's quite a lot of bird activity in there. So that does give birds an area of cover. They can come in over winter. Also gives cropping cover for the livestock and it keeps the integrity in the soil. So soil health is becoming really important as it is in other sectors. Uh, and I encourage um, operators and, and AD plant growers to really embrace that because digestate is a fantastic product, but if you can't keep the nutrients in the soil, that is, a, that is both a, an environmental problem and it is a financial problem because you're not making best use of your nutrients. 
And coming on to the last points of them, it comes down to the real basics of, of farming and to a degree engineering correct harvesting at the right time to ensure your dry matters, your sugars, your leaf density is right. Correct chop length to get your clamping, enough force and weight on the clamp and correct clamping. All real simple things, but the AD industry to a degree has been slow on some of these things to, to pick up on. And they often have been then the issue biologically. If your crop isn't right, you then can introduce a problem into your AD plant. Okay, this is this is my last slide, uh, and again, probably I could do a presentation in itself in it before we move into questions, because I can see we have quite a lot of questions brewing. Uh, so uh, my other business is Will Niles Natural Plant Food uh, Company, where we we take digest it as a byproduct uh, and we sell that in a liquid and a solid form. And just a little bit of history: I started developing that with my business partner Alistair Warner back in two thousand and fifteen. Because what we both recognised is really digestate on land does deliver fantastic results, but not all digestate is the same. There is real, there can be pronounced differences depending on the feedstock and depend on the AD process on how good that digestate is or how bad it is. Um, and this has been a real journey for, for myself and Alistair in in optimization of the AD plant and optimization of the feedstock to give us a product which is suitable for the gardening sector. And the gardening sector is a real interesting sector in really unlike uh, agriculture and farming, where you've got lots of suppliers supplying say the big six supermarkets. In the, in the gardening sector, you've got sort of two or three of actually probably five major suppliers of, of plant food fertilizers and compost supplying a lot. There is some big garden centers groups, but lots of little independent garden centers. And what we noticed, or we were very surprised of when we started looking at if we could provide digest it into the gardening sector was, was actually from, a, from an environmental point, how far actual the gardening sector is behind agriculture in its environmental cr credentials, its understanding, and also its technology developments. And um, that's probably from a manufacturer point of view, you know, traditionally compost is being made up of 80% peat. Uh, and all fertilizers uh, and weed control products have been synthetic chemicals uh, with very little, um, out, very little natural products. And what we found by testing, so in 2019, we fetched our products to market after extensive testing, and we were actually still going through that. So we're working with Lancaster University at the moment to, to really understand, you, you know, the financial benefits of this product in a commercial environment, which is, you know, which is important, um, is, you know, what it can do and what it can do, deliver to soil. And we have found Digest it, and this isn't the case for every digest I've said is when you get your plant operation right, you mix a certain feedstock together, you will get a fantastic product which really works in the in the horticultural sector. And that is what Will and Al uh, business is about. And we've been working hard at developing that. And 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 now we've actually there is a there is lots of other companies doing well, lots. There's a handful of other companies doing the same as us. And that's it in a way for us is actually a good thing because not many people really accept uh, that digest it is a suitable product uh, in the horticultural sector and that's a journey we've been going on to to educate consumers and it's something we we expect and we hope in the next few years develops um, and become much more commonplace okay so that is the end of my presentation and i open it up to everyone to have a chat and ask me questions Okie doke, thank you for that Will. Uh, so the first question is is from myself. Um, my question really is what, what are the overall return on investments for an average AD plant? And I suppose in, in, in sort of simple terms, why doesn't every business that produces organic waste feed into an AD plant to produce energy? Because if it's a good thing, then it, it should be happening everywhere, shouldn't it? Yeah, fundamentally AD plants have a lot of concrete and a lot of mechanical equipment bolted to them, which equates to 
quite a sizable asset investment. And AD has not necessarily been recognised from a financial aspect as a safe bet, where putting solar panels on your roof on the ground or a wind turbine up is, is seen actually as a safer bet, plus the tariff. Um, so really the success of AD plants have initially been born on the back of the tariff, which they are bolted to because of the sizable physical financial investment needed, which meant once that tariff support disappeared, there's very little incentive based on the energy price to build new AD plants. Now, the curveball is we're in a very different world than we were six months ago or a year ago. And I'm starting to see that change. I'm now getting people actually, I've got several clients going, I'm looking at it, my electricity cost is this or my gas cost is this. We are nearly at a point where we could build an AD plant. I've got a product I could use in it, whether it be waste or not, uh, to generate electricity. And we're just starting to see the very first seeds of that happening. Whether that continues, I don't know. The green gas incentive scheme is there, but that's got a 15 year guarantee on it. Feeding tariff was 20 year, like the RHI. So from a funding perspective, that was seen as much a, more a, uh, a secure funding bet. I don't know why five years, but it just seems to have affected confidence in the financial market to fund mm -hmm. plants. But now we're starting to see these electricity prices. I expect to see a lot more talk and movement around AD, whether that results in more AD plants. But if I go back to the very beginning of my slide, it kind of frustrates me. Why don't we have small AD plants on every waste producer location, mm -hmm. whether it be farm or industry? Because the more AD plants we have, the more freeable that technology is, the more people are working it. So actually more cheaper and attainable that technology is. Existing AD plants are costly to run. The technology is often bespoke, which makes it at the moment very expensive to repair, to source, and the timelines on that can be quite eye-watering. So mm. there's a lots of challenges, and the more we have out there, the more successful they'll become. And it's also building up the knowledge profile. So probably one of my biggest disappointments is why didn't, from a government point of view, they carry on with that waste, small AD plant. You know, that was a really neat solution to uh and that also helps meet a certain level of climate change obligations in emissions to air as well yeah yeah okay mate. i mean like you say you know if you look in the last the last two or three years the world has changed dramatically on all this stuff now um, yeah okay i think there was one ad plant commissioned officially in 2021 yeah. which is a real disappointment in the in them for the industry yeah, really. yeah. Yeah, no, I doesn't... mean, there's other plants been built, but that that is a, a not a sustainable number, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, right, so uh, Kalishi, if you're still on, uh, you've got a couple of questions. I don't know if you want to unmute yourself or whether you'd like me to, or whether uh, Will can see the the chat. Yeah, so I've I pulled it up. If not able to speak. Okay. How environmental you, safe? You look through them, yeah is direct application of digest state to soils, any regulations in the UK? Um, yes, there is lots of, there, well, there is regulation. I would say there's lots of regulation. Certainly from a waste perspective, there is the past 110 regulation. Uh, and that is becoming much more aware in actually how digest it is applied to land. And it comes back to simple, good farming practices managed application at the right time at the right amount where if you've got the right storage you can store sufficient product until the weather is in you know the climatic aspects are correct then they're all the real outside of all the other influences are probably the core things to ensuring a safe environmental application of digest it comes down to basic principles of any slurry or manure is careful and timed application to what the soil needs. Okay, and then there was another question. I think Kalichi did tell me his internet's bad. So um, the other question was, how is the biogas upgrade to biomethane carried out by your clients? If they do? So 
biomethane is that's probably one of the more costlier aspects of AD. So scrubbing uh, and cleaning is a very, very costly, and that's been a barrier to market for many people, as well as putting it into the grid. That's generally carried out by the client, then injected into the grid. We're not really at a point where we have almost cooperatives where we're taking raw biogas because to compress raw biogas, it is very dirty. So mechanically, it causes a lot of problems to the equipment which are involved in that process. So you really do need to clean it, remove the, you know, remove the contaminants from it before you actually do anything with it around your site. So uh, as I mentioned, biogas is a dirty product and it does have detrimental effects on any equipment which is, comes into contact with that product. So generally upgrading is always carried out by the client and then injected into the grid. Again, that has been a big barrier for a lot of people is the grid is been very slow. Our grid operators have been very slow to allow connections to export into the grid from a gas perspective. Okay, thank you. Um, Rodri Williams has a couple of questions. Rodri, do you want to, do you want to ask them? Hello, yes. Um, so how long can AD plant go? Um, I've heard, for example, that, yeah, if you've got losing power supply, you've only got a certain amount of time before you've got a big problem. Is that true? Or? It, it is, and it's it's similar as exactly if you were a, a livestock farmer and you have a cow go down in the parlour or you have a you get acidosis in a, a herd of sheep. So you have a very, in, you have a, a time frame for when the power turns off that you would lose agitation, you would lose temperature, etc. That will start to adversely affect the biology. And when that happens, then that knock on effect can be you get separation of the fibers, you get solidification in pumps and pipes, you get overpressurization, etc. etc. And it is an industry issue. A lot of AD plants initially were built, didn't necessarily have the right mechanisms in place to handle that. And so when things go wrong, it generally does result in a major problem um, because it is your one cow. You haven't got 500 others. So when you get a biological problem, you've just got your one AD plant and it has a biological problem. So it generally is a, a major problem. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, I've just got a quick second one as well. Um, yeah. If, for example, you've got an AD plant and you're feeding it uh, energy crop such as whole crop, can you then put a feed waste into that as well? Or is it a completely different game? For example, they're different um, AD plants for different applications. You can, but you need to, one, consider is it mechanically and technically able to take that type of feedstock? And then secondary, you would need to possibly develop the bacteria strain relevant to that feedstock. So the gradual introduction of that feedstock ramping up uh, because a, a sudden changeover can have a real adverse effect on biology. So a gradual introduction of that feedstock over time to build up the relevant bacterial strains to process that and uh, ensure that it's compatible because these are the things you, you can never really understand laboratory wise because all plants are different. So very important to, to do that in a gradual manner. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, we've probably got time for just one more question. Uh, and if people have got time to stay on after the recording, uh, if Will's got time. Yeah, I've got time, so I can stop on that. Questions, because uh, there are a few questions. So the last question from Martin Parsons. Hello, um, so as written, if uh, AD plant is running on energy crops that are planted, harvested and transported using diesel, what is the percentage of total diesel fuel energy used compared to the green energy produced by the AD? And I know there's no single answer there, but ballpark figure? I couldn't put a ballpark figure on it because the majority of my plants have got different processes. Fundamentally, if it's a ring fenced plant energy crop and it's on the doorstep, that is going to be substantially lower then fetching it in from x distance away on a diesel field so we do see huge variations in that and that started to factor into where we look at the carbon calculator within off gem where you have to do that calculation to understand that you come under the the criteria for that energy crop as a as an off gem aspect but also 
selling the electricity that does come under the microscope as well. Uh, so it is a it is a it is a challenging question. I think that's anything in renewables. Re all renewables require traditional fossil fuels to a degree, and I don't see that being completely phased out in a generation. We just we're seeing that naturally happening today. How that will happen, I don't know. But again, a lot of that comes down to best practice. So really, financial drivers of today are dictating that. You cannot afford to move crop, whether it be a waste or an energy crop too far because it costs so much money to move that product. And that's actually probably driving green credentials more than anything is, is the transport cost of, of, of feedstocks for AD. Thank you. Is that okay? I know it's, uh, I'm not answering the question, but it is a very, very difficult one. And I have huge variations across my sites that I look at. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're just about on an hour. So if I just wrap things up. Um, so thank you so much, Will, there for giving us an excellent presentation and taking time out to do that is very much appreciated. Um, I think you could you could go on for another hour with the questioning. It's a really interesting subject for everybody uh, and certainly very in vogue at the moment with what's going on with energy prices. So thank you to everybody for joining us today. I hope you can join us for our next lecture on the 20th of September where we're joined by IAGRI member Ben Turner, who's the COO from Agrimetrics, and is going to talk about um, data in the agri-food sector. I'd also like to mention our annual conference, which will be held at the East of England Arena in Peterborough on the 1st of November. We have a range of presenters who will be talking about sustainability in agriculture with a particular focus on soils. So please check that out on the website and book your place. So thank you very, thanks again for everybody for attending, and we'll see you next time.